um, pop the recording um, on now just to let everybody in the audience know um, that the event will be recorded. Um, although we can't see any of you, you can communicate as some of you have already noticed in the chat. Um, the best way for you to communicate will be through the Q&A um, section, which is just at the bottom. Um, you can ask questions in there and I will basically talk you through how today is going to work. Um, so, hello, <laughs> welcome everybody to our latest instalment for our York Hope Consortium Hope and Social Change Symposium series, which is led by my colleague Dr Indrajit Roy, in addition to brilliant colleagues in the English and History departments at the University, Claire, Sanjoy and Arnav. Thank you also to Sue from the events team who has been supporting us from the start of the year with the event advertisement and registration. So my name is Melissa Williams and I'm a 3 plus 1 PhD student and research assistant based in the Department of Politics at the University of York and I will be chairing or discussing <laughs> during today's session um, and we're delighted to be joined by PhD student Ian Foxley who is based within the Politics Department in the Centre for Applied Human Rights to discuss hope in the context of whistleblowing, speaking truth to power. So our event today will be in the discussion format. So um, Ian will kind of present on the topic and I'll ask some questions um, as it goes along. And then at around 20 to three, and um, roughly um, we'll have a Q&A section where audience members are encouraged to ask questions. Um, I will keep an eye on that, you know, as we're going. So if somebody asks a particularly burning question that relates to something that you're talking about, Ian, I'm sure you won't mind if they interject. Um, great. Yeah, and then um, just one final note, um, our event will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel and um, so you can visit this to look at our previous events or share with anybody who you think might be interested in today's topic but weren't able to make it and um, so if everybody's ready and um, we'll start um, and I think the first question that I have really um, is whether you could tell us a little bit about how you became a whistleblower. Um, okay great um, I'm going to treat this as a chat over coffee so um, excuse me if I have a sip of coffee every now and then. Oh, you've got a whiskey. OK. No, no, tea. <laughs> lemon tea. <laughs> yeah. And um, and this is my this is my 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 um, whistleblower's mug. So it says no coward soul is mine, which is a quote from Emily um, Bronte, actually. Um, and it's at the very heart of whistleblowing. How did I become a whistleblower? Well, I'm an ex-army officer. Um, I spent 24 years in the army and I did practically everything you can do operationally in the army. Um, I commanded a, an armored troop, an Arctic warfare troop, a parachute squadron, spent two years in special operations in counterterrorism, um, commanded a regiment on peacekeeping in Bosnia and ended up in, in Whitehall in the great machinery of government um, in equipment procurement. And then decided to leave the army and ended up in, um, uh, civilian life. I was the IT director for Domino's Pizza and you can say thank you. I put pizza ordering online um, at the time and then built two fiber optic networks around the UK to enable broadband for, for all you guys to have your laptops at home on your knees and um, ended up in Saudi Arabia as the program director for a 1.96 billion pound program to modernize all the communications for the National Guard. Um, until within a few months, I found things going wrong, things that were strange, things that were out of kilter with my experience, training and, and frankly, values, um, and eventually tracked it down to um, secret payments to um, secret uh, subcontractors in the Cayman Islands for whom I could see no discernible product or service or anything else they were giving us. And, you know, if something looks rotten, it probably is rotten, especially when you track it down to that extent. Um, and I decided that I wasn't going to be part of it, couldn't be part of it, um, and didn't want to be part of it. It, it contrasted with all, everything that I stood for and everything I wanted to be thought of in my life or remembered in my life. Um, and so I blew the whistle. And I chose the, the British brigadier of the military team governing the project to blow the whistle to because I thought it was safe and because I, I um, knew him, I'd known him for 20 years, thinking that, you know, he'd say, OK, right, um, let's deal with this. And he didn't. He, um, he rang London and gave it to the MOD, who said, give it back to the company and let's see what they do. Let them deal with it. 
And the company did. They rang me up four hours later and said, you know, the MD said, can you pop up to my office for a chat? And I did. And effectively, I got ambushed by him and the HR director, who was a Saudi princess, which is unusual in its own right. You don't normally find Saudi princesses who are HR directors. And um, they threatened me with arrest and jail in Riyadh, which, um, which is, <laughs> frankly, a death sentence um, or, or as near to it. And, um, and so I walked out, literally, as she disappeared off to go and phone the police. I disappeared out um, of another door with him shouting, come back here behind me, and swept my way, because I was on the 20th floor of the Faisalia Tower in the middle of Rio. Um, swept my way out through two security doors, hoping that he wasn't going to chase behind me shouting and she wasn't going to come the other way and the police weren't going to tumble out of the lift. And, um, and got in my car. And, and phoned the military team and said, what on earth is going on? That wasn't quite my words, actually, but there we go. Um, and, uh, and they said, get to us now. And got me into a safe house and said, get out of the country now. Don't wait. Um, and got me out that night um, or helped me get out that night. And, uh, and then I got back to UK and I went to see Airbus group because we were owned by Airbus in Paris and told them what was happening and I told the group compliance director you know who's on the main board and he was terribly polite and showed me the door and then I went to the MOD and spoke to them and said here's the evidence um, if you don't do something I will you've got five days oh and by the way you are now complicit so if you don't act I will take it that you are not acting because you know about it, you don't want it to happen. So you've got a burning fuse, get on with it. And uh, then the machinery of the investigative world took over and it took about 18 months before the Serious Fraud Office actually started a preliminary investigation um, and had to force them to that. And then it took about 11 years before we actually got the prosecution and we got the prosecution of Airbus Group because it was a spin-off from my blowing the whistle on the company to investigate the whole group. And they found another 10 contracts of, of corrupt dealings to a total of 22 billion euros. And between the Americans, the French and the British, they then fined them 3.6 billion euros and removed the whole board and Airbus had a secret group in the middle of their marketing department that was there to run corrupt contracts. I mean, it was a specific group set up to do it, had its own general counsel and its own compliance officers that taught people how to get around the rules. I mean, it was incredible. And then last year, my, uh, the company I blew the whistle on pleaded guilty after 10 years and were fined 28 million plus 2 million costs. And the, the last week, the final trial started of the managing director and the man he was operating with in the Cayman Islands. And I can't comment on that because um, that's sub judice, literally. But um, there you go. That's the story so far. Wow. Thank you so, so much for sharing that. I'm sure the audience, as I have, have got so many questions. But I think, you know, to start almost the theme of the consortium um, in light of, of what you've just told us. Could you perhaps tell us what your so sources of hope were kind of throughout this really uncertain disclosure process? I mean, it, it certainly had a lot of kind of, I don't even want to say ups and downs because I'm not quite sure what it <laughs> were. Um, but um, let's say the roller coaster um, that you went through, what, what were your sources of hope throughout this, you know, very long period? Well, if we look at it from the disclosure phase, the, the, the beginnings, when you find out that something's not right, because it's like it's like a murder mystery. You don't just trip over a body. You find something out of place. You find, you know, bits that don't seem to match up. And you, you then have these series of alarm bells going on. And your first hope is, I hope I'm wrong. I, you know, I, I hope I'm not looking at what I think I may be looking at. And the next bit is, is who knows about it and who can I trust? And, and every time you talk to someone about it, you have this nagging doubt in the back of your head of, you know, are you going to be betrayed? Are you, are you, are you going to survive? So it's a, it's a kind of hope of survival 
as well. Am I going to be safe? And and then there is this point of decision where you you disclose the wrongdoing. You have to choose the person if you can that that you 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 trust and you think is going to help. And you hope that that person in authority is actually going to believe you and do something about it. So there's a, a number of different forms of hope, which which are about really about security of you and and the, the secondary effects of that your family you know they're not just going to take you they're going to destroy everything around you if they can so it's it's really about security and and this inner thought of i'm going to take a step forward and i hope you're going to look after me and make sure that i'm not i'm not shot in the process that's the first series of hopes. Well, thank you again so much for sharing that. And I can see um, some questions already coming in through the Q&A. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask my final two on this stage, if that's OK with you. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd just like to ask next, what it is, you know, in light of these really terrifying circumstances, what, if any, positive kind of elements can be found to support individuals like yourself um, throughout this process? Um... You've got to believe in yourself. You've got to believe that what you're doing is right. You've got to you've got to know your own values, and you've got to stand up for them. Be prepared to stand up for them. You know, um, people come up and say, "Oh, you're so brave. You're so courageous." Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Fine. You know, let's go, let's get past that. You 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 don't think to yourself, "I'm going to charge the machine guns." You think, "I'm just going to do the right thing." The fact that you have to charge the machine guns is a different matter, but you 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 have to not just espouse your values; you have to live your values. And I think it happens to a lot of people in life. You you get asked at some point in time to make a decision about which direction you're actually going to go, what you're actually going to do, and doing the right thing is is sometimes not the easiest thing to do but you have to do it. I mean, I could not, we literally had this discussion this morning with my wife. Um, I could not have lived with myself if I hadn't done what I'd done because it would always have nagged at me that you were offered the choice and you didn't do what you should have done. And I didn't, I, I don't think any whistleblower really recognizes the ramifications of what they're doing at the time or the, the hatred that would come towards them and and i'm not joking there it really is hatred you know it's it's wickedness in its in its basic forms people trying to protect themselves and their reputations or what they did wrong you know and they're willing to unleash quite a lot of psychological violence and physical violence at you to stop you yeah it's um the three things that that I, I kind of nailed it down to that kept me going throughout the whole process are faith. Um, I'm a Catholic and I I'm, may not be a good Catholic, but it's in there. You know, if you're a Catholic, you're a Catholic for life. You know, you've got this bag of guilt you carry around, you know. So, so you know, I like to think that there's a, a great divine being who, who actually for once said, OK, and well done. Yep, you got it right. So faith. Um, faith in justice as well. You know, I have a great faith in the fact that if you refuse to back down, if you if you keep fighting and battling your way forward, the the British justice system will actually see you right. Now you can call me naive, you can call me a, a an innocent if you like, but but no, I believe in it, and I believe that it's a good system, and I believe that you know it can work for the better. Now, that doesn't mean I haven't had to fight for 11 years to make sure the system did what it was meant to do. I have had to fight. You know, at some point in time, four years ago, I wrote to the Attorney General and said, you've now sat on this for three years, um, having been the serious fraud office offered to actually, you know, prosecute, you've sat on it for three years. If you do not bring forward a prosecution now, I'm taking you to the Supreme Court. 
And it just happened to be after, after the government had been taken to the Supreme Court for proroguing Parliament. And they didn't want a second big case <laughs> in front of Baroness Hale in the same fortnight. So, you know, they went for a prosecution and, and everything happened thereafter. But it took a lot of fighting. So faith is the first thing. The second thing is um, family. Um, you have to have an anchor in life. And the second major anchor, because I think faith is one of them, the second major anchor is, is your, your partner. In my case, I've got, a, I've got a wonderful wife of 34 years who stood with me. And she had said, you know, I wish at times I wish you'd, you'd, you'd done something else. And I said, well, you know, you know me, I can't. Um, and I couldn't. And she said, yeah, I know. But wow, I do wish you had. But, but she's still there. And for a lot of whistleblowers, you know, they don't have that rock. But, but the family and, and your partner and your, your close friends who know you and support you and know what you did and why you did it, um, they are, are absolutely solid. I mean, it's wonderful. And the last bit is, is I think it comes out of character and, and a bit of training. I mean, my military training helped enormously. My special operations training helped enormously because you have to be resilient. You have to be fearless. You know, there's, there's Michel Foucault with his, with his book on fearless speech. And if you haven't read it, go and read it, please. Because um, it's all about whistleblowing. It's about the, the, the purity of the spirit of the, the courageous being who stands up to the powerful, you know. And there's a thing called parhesia, um, which is the ancient Greek classical principle of the powerful offering protection to the vulnerable in exchange for the vital truths that they need to know. And that's a principle that we need to reinvigorate back in modern society. And that's what I'm trying to do at the moment. I'm trying to get the law changed to protect whistleblowers. So the last bit is of the three Fs are face, family, and fearlessness. You, you have to be fearless. Do, do not live in fear. You know, if you do, then you, you will not be the person that you ought to be. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And I think if it's OK with you, um, one of the questions from the audience seems to fit in quite nicely with what you've just spoke about, um, if you don't mind. So yeah, no, no, go for it. as well as the compliment is thank you, Ian. Um, leaving a good legacy is always something that I aspire to, not for credit, but always doing the right thing. Have you always been confident in yourself and your morals, knowing what is right? Uh, have I always been confident? You mean, well, the, the underlying question there is, have you always done the right thing? Um, no, I'm a sinner. God, I've had, I've created, I've, you know, I've created mayhem with lots of, lots of, lots of young people in my, my evil youth. It's not quite evil. It's just being a normal young man. You know, you can't be a young, a young man and enjoy life to its greatest without breaking a few eggs and breaking a few hearts. So, yeah, have I always tried to do the right thing? Yes, I think I have. Have I always done it? Mm, you know, everybody gets a bit wrong. So, yeah, I, I think I've always tried to. Um, I've always wanted to stand up to bullies. You know, I have always stood up to bullies. I think, I think if you let bullies get away with it, they will just come back and bite you again or somebody else, somebody weaker. And you, somebody has got to be prepared to stand up to bullies. And strangely enough, it's, it's like the Me Too movement once the first person stands up and and takes the first couple of blows others watch them and come to them they're like magnets you know you attract people to also stand up and you you give them courage it's a kind of natural gift that comes out you know it's it's about inspiration but you don't do it because of the inspiration but your example can be an inspiration and even if it's, you know, the bully on the bus when you're a teenager or the bully in the office who, who tries to take advantage of the secretary or the, 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 the bully in the street who tries to mug someone or push around a little old man who's sitting on the side of the street or kicks the homeless man. You know, we need to speak up about that. We need to actually intervene and be brave enough ourselves to say, hey, look, no, that's wrong. You know, stop it. 
Definitely. Thank you again for that. And I think again, while we're kind of talking about this dis disclosure phase, um, we have another question that I think really fits in and kind of is what I wanted to, to ask too, which is um, from Chris Taylor. Um, and they ask, to what extent do you think it would have been harder to blow the whistle had you still been within the military culture? What do you think you might have done differently had you not known the brigadier who you first approached? How important was it that you knew him? If you cut me, I'm green. I don't bleed blood, I bleed khaki. Um, I'm still within the military culture. You know, anyone who knows me knows that, that you, you can't be in the military for 24 years and not be imbued with the military culture. But the military culture is, is in our army at least, is, is for 99.9% .9 of us a really good thing. You know, we believe in integrity, we believe in honesty, we believe in leadership, we believe in courage, we believe in loyalty. So I don't think I couldn't have been in the military culture, right? It's ingrained into me. Did it matter who, who the brigadier was? No. He just happened to be the guy in the command appointment who was running the military liaison team there, whose actual purpose was to, to assure and govern the contract. And therefore, when I worked out that the, all the directors in my company were crooked and knew what was going on and were facilitating the corruption, the one man, the nearest man I could get to who should have been able to do something was the brigadier. Didn't matter to me whether I'd known him before or not. You know, he has an appointment. He should fulfill that appointment. And he tried to. I mean, he... he did what good soldiers do he refer you know if you can't cope you refer it upwards and the mod and i don't know who in the mod i still don't know um i've got a pretty good inkling but it's it's you know very senior level um told him what to do and being a soldier he did it um i was betrayed i know that i was betrayed by by the mod um he happened to be the representative in country but there again i don't think they thought that the company and the princess and the royal family would do what they did i don't think they thought that they would threaten my life i thought that they would say hey look um you know why don't you take a leave of two or three weeks and we'll find you another job somewhere and get you another you know another number um because what we've and i at the time Maybe again, I'm naive. I didn't wreck it was crooked. It was wrong. It's corrupt. But was it political? Was it done because of the political and strategic relationship between the two countries? At the time I blew the whistle, that wasn't apparent. And nobody said, oh, by the way, you know, um, come and have a quick word with the ambassador. We need to tell you what's really going on here. It was a crooked relationship. And if you if you read the the Guardian article on the 9th of May earlier this week the evidence that's coming out at the moment actually shows that it was going on for 32 years across the whole life of the contract because the contract that i went to run was a fifth of you know a series of contracts but the arrangements were set up in 1978 under king abdullah when he was a crown prince and he was the head of the national guard and what appears to be being shown in in the evidence at the moment is that People have known about this and condoned it for a long time as a political act. Now, the ramifications of that are quite enormous. Um, and I think we'll just follow that over the next three to six months. I'll leave that question there if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. So I think um, if it's okay, we'll kind of move on a little bit now. Um, and I'd like to know um, kind of what happened um, once you decided to raise a concern. So I know you've sort of touched on it, um, but just a little bit more detail, if, if I may. Um, well, having raised the concerns of the Brigadier, I, I mean, I crossed my fingers and hoped that he was going to actually, you know, do something, get a reference and and maybe the, the managing director and the other directors would have been suspended and we could actually get on with running the contract, but run it cleanly. Um, and that didn't happen to me. Um, what happened was that it went horribly, horribly wrong. Um, and they, they terminated my contract. I lost my job. Um, 
they attacked my character, they defamed me and said, you know, um, they called me a thief for taking the information and giving it outside of the company. I mean, it didn't matter that the information was actual evidence of, I mean, very good evidence of corruption. I mean, you can't really get away from signed checks to bank accounts in the COVID islands. So, you know, um, they defame your character. And this, this is interesting because you get what I call the three assassins come at you. The first assassin is a real assassin. He's going to threaten your life and you've got to get out. You've got to hope, you know, that you choose the right path, choose the right people, um, choose the right extraction route. Um, and then the second assassin comes at you and that's the commercial one. That's the, that's the, the company comes at you and they destroy your career. They try and, and whittle you down and try to destroy your character. Because if you destroy the character of the whistleblower, you invalidate the evidence. And so there's this, this great cry of mad or bad. You know, they try and draw the picture of the individual as someone who's bad, who's a thief, as someone who's a bad manager, someone who's, who's a troublemaker, or someone who's mad. Oh, he's barking mad. You know, he, this can't be, can't be true. You know, he's, he's ridiculous. He's, 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 you know, he's screwy in the head. And in trying to do that, they try to invalidate the truth that you're speaking so that everyone kind of wonders what you're about. And you can see this time and time again. Um, you talk to any of the nurses or doctors in the, in the NHS who tried to blow the whistle, the same mechanisms apply. Um, I hope I don't lose my job. I hope I don't lose my career. You, I, I couldn't get another job because you're tarred with a brush of whistleblower and people say, oh, I don't want one of them in my organization. Um, and that impacts on your income and your savings and your health because it's an immensely stressful experience. And inevitably that then impacts on your family who are the kind of the secondary victims in all of this. And you have to just trust in yourself and your, you know, what you did and why you did and how you did it and find a way of surviving really. Um, yeah, so that's what happened. There aren't many positive elements in that, are there? Um, <laughs> it sounds pretty ghastly, um, and it is pretty ghastly. And, and that's why we need to do something about it. And this is where, you know, my lived experience has turned into activism, you know, campaigning for legislative reform, trying to get the Public Indis Disclosure Act 1998, um, which was groundbreaking at the time, but has really fallen behind the real world and others have, have, have you know taken over the global lead that we had um, and we need to change that so, so I'm a great believer that you know we've got to make good come out of evil um, and that's what we're going to try and do we're trying to change the law to make it illegal to take reprisals against whistleblowers cross sector you know I don't it's not just about corruption in, in commercial contracts got to be quite clear about that you know it's about it's about you know sexual trap sexual abuse it's about it's about it's about malpractice in in healthcare you know making sure that the vulnerable in society are are looked after and when they're not we speak up about it yeah there we go thank you again for that and i suppose again off those reflections my next question would sort of be how do we ensure that the messenger or the person who who is you know blowing the whistle can deliver the somewhat unwelcome, unwanted, undesirable message without getting, I mean, stopped, shot in the process? You know, how, how, do, we, how do we ensure this? Well, there are a number of things. There are, there are physical things that we have to do is provide mechanisms where people can speak the truth, but speak the truth safely. So you can have anonymous helplines, you can have confidential helplines. I prefer confidentiality, agreed and assured confidentiality rather than anonymity, because anonymity doesn't allow you to validate the information and the reason why the person's speaking up. I do believe in assured confidentiality. So you have to have a, a, a mechanism that allows that. And, and Perhaps underneath that, you've got to have a culture within the organization and within the society which, upon which it's founded that recognizes this, this, this ideal, the Parhesian ideal of the powerful guaranteeing 
protection to the vulnerable in order to know what's going wrong within the system. You know, don't be scared of knowing what's going wrong, because if you know what's going wrong, you can do something about it. If you, if you don't know what's going wrong, it's like a cancer. It will just grow. And, and you know, it's, it's a very simple logic. You know, if the doctor tells you that you've got cancer and diagnoses it, do you shoot the doctor? No. <laughs> you say, thank you. Now, what are we going to do about it? You know, if, if, if your bank manager tells you that you're being ripped off and scammed through your bank account, do you shoot your bank manager? No. You say, what are you doing to help me? <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. If, 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 if my children come to me and say, Daddy, I've got a problem. I've got a problem at school with, with, with this teacher who is beating me or, or bullying me or whatever. I don't, I don't slap my child and say, don't, don't tell lies, don't go away, I don't want to know. I embrace them, I give them a cuddle, I make sure that they're, they're, they know that they are wanted and loved and appreciated, and I say, thank you for telling me. I'm now going to go and do something about that. And then my children will come to me again, or their brothers and sisters will come to me again. And that's what we have to stitch into society. This idea that we are a caring society, we do want people to be able to speak the truth. And, and actually, we actually have to persuade our politicians. We have to persuade the people in power, the government, that this is in the greater good for the whole of society, across society. We have to protect the vulnerable. We have to protect the weak. And we have to know what's going wrong so that we can do something about it, so that they can do something about it. And my problem is that they're scared that if you put in too many protective mechanisms, they'll find out too much. <laughs> and they'll, they'll be flooded by people saying, oh, by the way, did you know about this? And did you know about him? You know, that, that's the worry at the moment. But that's not to say we shouldn't try to change it. Yeah, thank you again um, for that. And I suppose my kind of final question on this, this part would be going back to, I suppose, the theme of the consortium. Um, what sources of hope can we offer that protection will be afforded to those like you um, who have the courage to speak up? Uh, sources of hope. There's a number of organisations in the UK, and in fact, there's a number of organisations in the world who are, are trying to work to protect whistleblowers. The organisation in the UK, one of the leading ones, is a charity called, called Protect, used to be called Public Concern at Work. And they, they actually fought very hard to get the Public Interest Disclosure Act um, into an act of law. Um, and they have a helpline. They have a body of, of lawyers who will give you legal advice. They will channel you to the right kind of person who can respond to your um, uh, disclosure of wrongdoing. Um, there's another organisation called Whistleblowers UK, which I started. Um, along with a few other whistleblowers in about uh, 2012, actually. And we started it as a support organisation for whistleblowers to give them three things. And this was born out of my experience of what wasn't around when I needed it to be around. And the first thing is therapeutic counselling. You need, you need a friendly ear to be able to pour out your troubles and say, look, this is what happened. And these are my worries. This is how it's affecting me. Um, and secondly, you need proper legal advice to make sure that you get the process right so that you can't be attacked by the company or the organisation or sometimes the individual. Um, and thirdly, you need help with media support. And the media support is really interesting. It's not so that you can, you know, go to the papers and blab because that's not what it's about. It's about telling the right people about what's going wrong. But when you're reveal something about an, a big organization certainly a commercial organization they've got a lot of resources and they will attack you and you need some way of rebalancing the equation in terms of resources and validation of information and validation of the sources that says no you're right you know there is something wrong here and we have investigative journalists who are trained and able and willing and paid by us to go and root down and root out those other bits and pieces that you couldn't get to so that we can really get to the heart of the matter. Um, 
and they've become a bit political now. I mean, they've, they've become the secretariat of the all parliamentary, um, all party parliamentary group on whistleblowing, which is trying to change the law. Um, but actually, they've come away more from that support organisation. But there are other people. There are other organisations. Um, there's the Whistleblower International Network. There's in America, I think, called the Government Accountability Project, who have been operating this space for about 30 years, who are brilliant, absolutely brilliant. You know, they kind of lead the way. And there's, there's PPLLA in, in Africa who, who look after whistleblowers in Africa, across Africa. Um, there's an organization in, in Canada and there's another organization in Australia. So the, there are people out there who are willing to, to help. And in Europe, you know, the, the EU have just put out a directive on whistleblowing, which really changes the protective mechanism across Europe. What we're trying to do now is, is get the UK to catch up with that and put protective mechanisms in law in this country and set up a, um, an independent commissioner for the protection of whistleblowers to make the regulators do what they're meant to do. So the thing to remember is you're not alone. You know, there are people out there who are willing to listen and are willing to help. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you again so much for, for that. And I think looking at the time, I probably only have time for one more question until I'm going to have to give the audience a chance. Um, so I'll try to compress kind of my final um, questions that I had to you into one. Um, so could you tell me a little bit about kind of where you are now and what, what the current situation is or as much as you can about the current situation? You know, what, what are the outcomes? And the outcomes. Based on this. What hope can we offer to others who may speak up? Okay. Um, the first outcome is that Airbus Group were held accountable. They did a deferred prosecution agreement and no matter how big you are, and they are the biggest defense manufacturer in Europe, they're worth billion, and trillions. They were fined 3.6 billion and removed the whole of the board of the group. I mean, that is staggering. Um, Secondly, the, the, the company that I, I blew the whistle on admitted guilt. And we then get onto the individuals, but I'm not going to touch that bit, but they are being held accountable. So I am vindicated. You know, what I did has actually come to fruition. The system appears to have worked. Um, I'll let you know in about a month's time. <laughs> um, we are working to be compensated because I have a fundamental belief. I don't believe that whistleblowers should be rewarded, you know, in a set system, just like America runs, the SEC runs a, a reward system where you get a percentage of the fine. I don't believe in that because I think it, it opens up the argument to the fact that people are only blowing the whistle because they want money. That's not what you do it for. But equally, you don't do it so that you can have your life destroyed, so you can have your career destroyed, so you can have your your marriage and your home life destroyed and you should there should be a proper system of compensation to ensure that that you are set back on your feet you're rehabilitated back into the professional and personal life um and you know to set the state status quo really back again so i think that is right and proper um and i think we need to have a system where those who take reprisals against people who tell the truth should actually be answerable for it in a court of law and should be fined or should be disqualified as directors in future. And only by setting that kind of example will, will the system change going forward. Um, one of my deepest wishes is that, that no matter what happens to me, and I, I hope it all that will come to fruition, is that I can be an example to others that you can do this and you can survive the process. Not only that, but you know, you can you can hold true to your values and you can you can be held as an example that it's a hard fight. It's taken me 12 years now. Um, it'll be 12 years in December, so 11 and a half. That's a hard, hard task to ask anyone. But if you do stick with it, then, yeah, you can live with a good soul. Definitely. Thank you so much for, for your... Oh, is 
broke up there can you still hear me yeah yeah yeah, you're yeah good. sorry I lost you for a second there thank you so much for, for your reflections I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed being able to ask you some more questions um about whistleblowing about your experiences um but I will now hand over to our audience who I can see there's quite a few questions in the chat and um, will this will last about 15 minutes so if anybody else has any more questions please get them in <laughs> um <laughs> We have three questions um, from Lydia Ebden. Um, so the first one, I think, will be a quick one, um, which is any particular book to recommend by Foucault, please. Yeah, fearless speech. There you go. Fearless okay. speech, but don't don't just go for fearless speech. Look online for the series of lectures he gave in um, I think it was 1998, just before he died, actually, at Berkeley University. He gave a series of six lectures. If you go looking for those, then those are really the basis out of which the book Fearless Speech is made. But um, yeah, go looking for those, they're the, the two key ones. Thank you. And then um, the next question is, have you had any repercussions since? Do you still have any fear? And would you be free to travel to Saudi as tourists? I would never go back to Saudi. I don't think I would be safe at all. In fact, I would probably steer clear of most of the Middle East because the reach of certain people is is quite long. Mm. Um, and in that part of the world, I would not feel safe. But the world's a big place. I can go other places, you know, I can do other things. You know, there's other places I haven't been yet. I've been to 63 countries so far. Wow. I've still got another 140 to do quite the record <laughs> thank you again for that and I think the final question um from Lydia is how did you get on engaging government i.e your MP my MP has been fantastic um he's a conservative he's a guy called Kevin Hollenrake who's the MP for uh Rydale Morton and Thursk um and he has been absolutely brilliant He's one of the, he's a rare animal. He's, a, he's an honest and good MP. You know, I, I trust in his integrity. He's the chairman of the uh, Fair Banking, Business and Banking, APPG. Um, he's the co-chair of the APPG on whistleblowing. And he's a straight guy. He's a good player. And he has been... When I started down this, this route of trying to persuade the politicians, the secret to that is finding a champion within the House of Commons, not the House of Lords. I mean, you can start with the House of Lords, but you need a champion in the House of Commons who's actually willing to stand up and speak up and, and brief you and gather support across that house and then, and then the other house as well. But, but he's been fabulous. And we've, we've made major advances. I mean, we are, we now have a collaborative project going forward with Protect. We had a meeting with the Under Secretary of State for, for Business um, and Labour Matters 10 days ago. We have put forward four or five measures to go into the Economic Crime Bill Part 2, which was in the Queen's speech. So we've got a, a platform within the government agenda in a realisable timescale and if we can ensure that certain clauses are in there, we will take the game forward to protect whistleblowers. So find a good MP. And to everyone who's listening, you know, speak to your MP, write to them and say, you need to push the business ministry. You need to push Quasi Quartag to actually ensure that in the Economic Crime Bill Part 2, there are clauses to protect whistleblowers. Because it doesn't matter about investigating wrongdoing. You've got to know about it in the first place. And if you don't protect the people who stand up and tell you the truth about this, others will not do so in future. And so there's no point in passing that law unless you put in the protective mechanisms. I hope that helps. Again, I think Lydia has <laughs> thank you a few times in the comments. Um, so I think for our q and I think that's um, all we've got so far. I wonder if Indrajit has any um, questions. I know you've been <laughs> sat peacefully throughout. <laughs> no, I did. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. I think there was just lots of things in there which resonated with uh, what we've heard before. Uh, and one of the things that really struck me, this is more of a comment, not a question. So, you know, that really struck me was your, you know, discussion on faith. 
and the way in which your personal confessional belief sort of you know keeps you going and we we had a series on how faith helped people navigate covid for instance uh, you know which was organized by our health colleagues and so that was really really um useful as well as you know got me think about the cross uh, you know faculty cross discipline sort of ways of thinking about uh you know faith religion uh you know idea of as you i think put it uh you know there's a being out there you know it could be one being it could be many beings whatever you know there's somebody out there looking out for you and i think that's quite powerful um so thanks for that uh i think it's it's quite sort of uh, useful to think along those lines um i was also struck by and i think this is this is the more interesting bit and you know perhaps contentious well i'm not going to say that this is something i disagree with because i i do think there's there's a lot lot going on there uh, uh but you know thinking about hope in terms of uh, you know when, when you put it the you, you know the the duty of the powerful to protect the weak and i think that's that's really really interesting uh, and you know gets you to think about the realistic basis of hope you know areas or places or societies where such expectations that the powerful will protect the weak um you know there's something going on there you know there's something that can get people to to address the powerful you know whether it's the emperor back in the day whether it's you know the the good lord who sort of looks looks upon you whether it's the feudal lord or the divine lord you know yeah. it, it's um you know any of those and and i thought in that sense you know it, it, there was a lot going on there in terms of the coalitions that could be built between the powerful and the weak against those who are sort of seen to be uh, you know breaking the system um and 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 i think i like the way you put it you know there's it's in the self interest of the powerful to listen to the weak and take action because that's what will keep their position going absolutely and i think that's a really interesting way because it you know it it's it it, it really gets you to think about how hope might well be about maintaining the status quo and stability rather than shaking up things uh to a way that nobody really wants uh or nobody really knows what will come to and i i find this very contentious because of course there are also lots of people who would believe quite the opposite you know which is that you must shake things up a bit and you know lead lead to you know something new and different um and i thought this was a really really useful way to think about hope and a very realistic way to think about hope and i want to I think sorry I think I think hope is an attitude of mind. Mm. I think I think if you if you believe in the greater good if you believe in the the greater good of society or a greater spiritual good I mean I'm very lucky I have both. Um you have this attitude of mind that that I aim for I have a vision. I have a vision of a better world. I have a vision of where I want to be in that world. Mm. Um and I say to my students, Melissa, you might have heard me say this before, you know, um if you don't know where you are in life when you're when you're young, where you want to go or what you want to be, sit down for a moment and write your own obituary. Mm. Write what you would like to be written about you mm. when you die. And then set about achieving it mm. you know work out what do i have to do in order to have that obituary mm. so lay out your hope mm. and then and then let it channel you mm. let you let it let it push you in the direction that you see yourself being in 20 30 40 50 years time mm. you know i've lived a very full life i've i've i've, I've been very blessed mm. you know it's been it's had it's been a roller coaster but it's been a real adventure <laughs> you know you know i never <laughs> promised it to be easy i promised it to be fun <laughs> but tell me in areas or in societies where such expectations of the powerful protecting the weak may not exist what would be your advice to fellow whistleblowers you know you 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 said you had someone to appeal to you know there there is there is you know whoever you know that you, you, there are systems in place uh, and there is a societal expectation in this country perhaps that the powerful will protect the weak and there are similar expectations elsewhere as well but there may be you know areas or contexts or societies where such expectations simply don't exist due to historical reasons um what might be your advice to fellow whistleblowers there 
Um, if any. I be I've become a little bit of a revolutionary here, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> but but I don't think that's a bad thing if you're a revolutionary for the right reasons. Yeah. You know, I, I don't believe in, I'm not anarchic. I'm not believing in throwing over the system because it's crap and, and leaving nothing in its place. You know, if you're going to throw over the system, you've got to have something better to put in its place mm -hmm. or a vision of something better to put in its place. Mm -hmm. You know, if I were if I were a Russian at the moment, mm -hmm. I, I would not believe in the vision that's being sold to me, mm -hmm. given the information that I have yeah. at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that there are others like me who feel the same way who do not want to live under a yoke of oppression, mm -hmm. who do not want to be able to, to or, or have to live with their, their, their voice stifled, mm -hmm. you know, not able to speak out. Mm -hmm. I would hope there are others. And then you have to find a path with them that allows you to have that voice, which allows you to, to and I'm not saying fomenting revolution, but it, it could be looked at as that. But, you know, I refuse to live in chains. Mm. I refuse to live in fear. Mm. You know, and, and I know that, you know, if I, if I had been in Ukraine, I would have put my wife and my children on the train and sent them to a place of safety. And I would have kissed them goodbye and gone back in and fought. Mm. And I said this to Emma about a month, two months ago, and she said, yeah, I know, you know. And I'm going to tell you something you don't know, is that I have two Ukrainians living in my house at the moment. Mm. Um, I have a mother and daughter who, who, we have a mother and daughter who, who came to us and we sponsored and they're living with us and will do until it's safe to go home. Mm. Why? Because actions like that give others hope. Mm. It, it allows others a place of safety. And, and Putin's stupid. Because if, if you allow me to send my wife and children to a place of safety and turn around to fight you, I'm going to fight you. And I don't have to worry about my wife and children. You just created an extra 500,000 troops, mm. you know, who may not be better, well trained at first, but they will get to be better trained. And they're fighting for their homeland. They're fighting for their values. They're fighting for their wives and their children. You know, that's a very silly thing to do, <laughs> you know. You ain't going to win, mate. <laughs> That's where that coalition that you mentioned, you know, I think becomes... A coalition of hope. Mm. Yeah, you know, yeah. We, we don't know whether it's going to be a better world, mm. but we can certainly try and make it one. Thanks, but thanks so much for that. Uh, I'll hand back mm. to Melissa. Yeah, no, thank you again for, for those questions as well. It was, I'm quite interested with, with your final question there, Inchit, because I suppose that was going to be mine, really, you know, thinking of, you know, your faith, Ian, in, in the rule of law within this country, you know, not even looking at this, you know, country as an example, but others, what, mm. what would you expect? And I mean, revolution was definitely the last thing I thought <laughs> <laughs> you were going to say. Um, I've learned a lot about you today. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's been absolutely brilliant um, to have you. I'm sure, Indrajit, I agree. This has been a really, really thought-provoking um, afternoon in addition to the consortium. And I hope we can keep these conversations going um, around the theme of hope. Um, I think we're going to have to close there. We do have two minutes left. Um, so thank you again, um, Ian, um, for joining us today. Um, and if anybody else wants to catch up with the series or keep up with the next few events that we have in place, um, please follow us on social media. Or if you want to see a recording of this event, um, I'm going to get it up by the weekend. And that's Futures of Hope um, on YouTube. Um, but other than that, that's everything from me. Um, Ian, is there anything else that you'd like to say before um, we end the call? Well, I, I hope I pass my viva and I hope my thesis is good enough to, um, to give me my doctorate. You know, I've got till October to finish the thesis and um, hopefully graduate by the end of the year around January next year. So that's my final hope. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. OK. <laughs> take care, everybody. <laughs> All right. Take care. Pleasure to be with you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. bye.